Hello, welcome along to a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan. Thank you so much for agreeing to come with me on this journey across the universe to learn some of the most amazing stuff that's lurking around inside. This week we'll learn about a caterpillar who has just seemingly realised really how brutally dangerous it is. Also we'll talk about climate changey stuff and why it's causing a mega drought in America. And also we'll learn why you float sometimes and other times you sink. I've also got some of your questions on the way in a sec. First, let's catch up with one of our favourite experts on the show. This is Professor Hallux. Professor Hallux's Pathology Puzzles with the Royal College of Pathologists. Now, I know you love Time Stop Crime Stop, but you have to turn it off because I've got some pathology puzzle cards here. Brilliant! I love a good medical mystery. What have you got? OK, here's a good question. Why, when you have a blood test, do they take blood in several different tubes? Well, when you have a blood test, the chances are that your doctor has asked for several different tests to be performed at the same time. Different tests may require several samples because different bits of the blood are tested. It's just easier and safer to have separate samples. Here's one about forensic pathology, the sort that's all about dead bodies, just like in Time Cop Crime Cop. Nanobot, how many times do I have to say the name of the show is Time Stop Crime Cop? Whatever. Does everyone have an autopsy when they die? No. About one in every five people has an autopsy after their death. The most common reason for an autopsy being requested is that the cause of death is not known. Perhaps the person who died hadn't seen a doctor for a long time, or their death was sudden and unexpected, or was being investigated by doctors, but a diagnosis hadn't yet been made. It's in situations like this, where there is a puzzle or a mystery about what's happened. This is where autopsies are performed. They're carried out by specially trained doctors called histopathologists, who have to study for over 10 years before they can be forensic pathologists. They're brilliant at cracking the case. Right, final question. It's about health screening. Our genes carry lots of information about us, so is there a genetic test that can tell what diseases I'm going to develop in the future? It is possible to test for certain conditions because the evidence is right there inside the genes in our cells. But most diseases are caused by a mixture of causes, so it's not quite so easy. Well, whatever the pathological puzzle or the medical mystery, it's good to know the pathologists are on the case. Professor Halix's Pathology Puzzles with the Royal College of Pathologists. Find out more at funkislive.com slash Halix. Let's get some of your questions answered then. If you've got anything sciencey that you want figured out, let me do it for you to ask me. You just need to leave it as a review for the Fun Kids Science Weekly over on Apple Podcasts. Uh, that's what Callum has done. He's six years old. Callum asks, why do mammals hibernate? Well, during times of the year, Callum, when there isn't a lot of food around, it doesn't make much sense for a creature to be wandering around trying to find it. Instead, they use that time to, to save energy. And they plan their year around this. In the months before they hibernate, uh, when there's an abundance of food all around, they'll stock up. They'll eat loads of it to keep them going. They will store all that energy that they get as fat. And then when they rest up over the winter, they will drain that fat energy. That's what will help keep them going. That's why they hibernate, because it's much better than running around looking for food that isn't there. Thank you so much for the question, Callum. This one is from Jack. He is seven years old from Lymington, and he wants to know how blood cells are made. Get ready for a big word, Jack. They're made as something... It's a process called hematopiosis. Blood cells are made in the bone marrow, which is a spongy bit. It's right inside your actual bones as well. Not all of them, but some of them do have bone marrow. And inside the bone marrow, you've got stem cells. Stem cells are vitally important. It is their job to make new blood cells. And they do that in a pretty insane way. Uh, They make copies of themselves. And then those copies can become whatever blood cell they fancy. The stem cell divides, it multiplies, it makes clones of itself, and then it morphs into either red or white or a platelet blood cell. I mean, it's probably amazing, Jack, isn't it? It's probably like Doctor Who stuff. You make new blood cells because your stem cells makes clones of itself, which then can change what it is. It's amazing. Thanks for the question. 
And finally, from Charlotte in Care Philly, who asks why we can sink sometimes when we're heavy, when we're swimming, and other times uh, we can float when we're light. It's all to do with the air that's in our lungs, Charlotte. You see, air is lighter than the water around you. So you, when you've held your breath in a proper, <gasps> when you've done that, there's lots of air in your lungs and it will rise to the surface. It will pull you up. But when you blow out when you go underwater, there's no air in there to keep you floating, so your heavy body will sink to the bottom. Thank you for the question. If you've got anything science that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it as a review for the Fun Kids Science Weekly over on the Apple Podcast Store. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. We're talking about cars today. How do you make them? How do you design them? How do you think about the science involved in getting them going? Uh, and we're joined by a proper car genius. Mark Bryden is the lead designer uh, for customer projects at Rolls-Royce. We've gone to the top of the tree. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, hi, Dan. Great to be now, here. Brilliant. No, it's so good that you're here. Um, now, Rolls-Royce, they're known as, as one of the top car makers. So what's the science behind why Rolls-Royce engines are thought and valued to be better than others? Dan, we put an awful lot of effort into um, making the best best car in the world. Uh, that takes a, an awful, awful lot of time, a lot of a lot of effort indeed, um, to to make the best engines, the best ride, the, the best looking cars. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a challenge for us, but um, I think you'll agree that that we uh, that w- we achieved that. In terms of the engine, though, Mike, you say that it's um, well, just the the car generally. You say it's a smooth ride. What is it that's making it a smooth, ro- a smooth ride? What's happening uh, in the engine to make it maybe louder and sound like a beast or quieter so we hardly notice it's there? What's going on? So we've got all sorts of technology underneath, underneath the bonnet. So we have things like a satellite-aided transmission, which um, makes the, um, the, the drive of our cars incredibly smooth. Um, we call our ride a magic carpet ride. Uh, but then we have some of our sort of meaner, more uh, dynamic cars, our black badge cars, um, which are more focused on performance to have sort of that more aggressive uh, sound and feel uh, to the way that they drive. Um, so we've got a, a very large engine indeed underneath the bonnet, a, a twin turbocharged V12 engine, um, and that provides a, an incredible amount of power to the driver. Unpack that for me if you can. Turbocharged, V12, horsepower. What do these things mean and why does it make a car drive so much faster than another? So the, the, more, the more power you have, it um, allows you to either um, you know, drive very quickly but be quite, quite silent and quite tranquil um, or um, depending on the, on the character of the car that the customer would like, um, can be really quite aggressive. So you can... Uh, travel at a little bit more of a, a dynamic s- speed if you want to, um, and uh, yeah, that's that's what the the, the the bigger engine allows. What does actual V12 mean, though, Mike? What, 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 ah, is, so, it, what, what, what is a V? What, what, what's in a V? What, what are there 12 of? So a V12 is essentially an arrangement of cylinders under the bonnet. So um, uh, a normal car would have around about four cylinders under the bonnet. Um, we have 12, um, and it's two banks of six uh, pointing inboard to create like a V-shape, a V-orientation. Uh, so you have six from one side, six from another, uh, and that's why it's called a V-12. So it's talking around the, the orientation of the, uh, of the cylinders. I guess we should take it right back before we find out how you design cars bespoke personally for everyone that wants them and talk about actually making a car uh basically mike we, we take questions from people on the show um, okay kids all around the world they send in these questions and one is very simple oscar asks how are cars made so if you can as as simply as possible take us through the process of what you make first what's the first thing you fit to a car what's the first thing you think about then how do you build on that so it becomes the car that we see w- when we buy it so that's a, a great question that, that Oscar has there. In terms of how we how we make a car, we first of all start with the body. So um, the body is created from from uh, predominantly metal. So we uh, form the beautiful elegant choice, um, and then this body is then is then painted within our paint shop. And there are many 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 layers of paint that go onto the car to create the 
the beautiful finish that we have on, on our Rolls Royces. Uh, following that, um, the, in parallel, the, the engine is, is created. So the power plant that we were talking about earlier that powers the car along, um, that's created. Um, and then these two parts come together in what we call um, a, a marriage. So we have this, this sort of uh, linking up of the powertrain with the body. And along the production line, various elements of the interior are, are added to the, to, to the car. So our uh, leather trimmed upholstery um, is brought in along with all of the, the beautiful woods and technical finishes um, that we have in the interior. Um, and then all sorts of elements start to, to come and be added to the car as it makes its way down the production line in Goodwood, um, such as the, the, the wheels, the, um, all of the details like the headlamps, all of the jewellery of the car. And, um, and then one of the final things that we, that we do um, when we're building a Rolls-Royce is take it for a drive. So every single Rolls-Royce that's built is actually taken out on the roads around Goodwood and um, check that it's driving properly, check there's no strange noises and everything's working okay. Um, and the, the experts that do that have these, um, the, uh, a great ability to pick up on any of these problems um, so the car's absolutely perfect before it leaves, leaves the production line. Now, I, in my brain, I kind of think designing a car might be quite easy. I've seen enough cars. I know they've all got four wheels. I know that they've got engines. Some of them have a spoiler. What are the things involved in designing a car? What do you need to think about that no one else would normally think about when designing a car? What are the secrets involved that maybe might not be too obvious in getting a car to work on the roads? So when, um, when I'm designing a bespoke car at, at Rolls-Royce, the things that I need to think about are mainly our, our customers. So I'm designing uh, cars that are for literally one, one customer. So I need to think about what they want and then also about new things, things that have never been seen before. Um, and as you say, there's, you know, there's lots of cars out there, lots of different um, body styles, different interior designs um, and the real challenge for us to, is to continually uh, push the boundaries of, of um, what's possible on a car um, and to, to continually design something that's interesting and makes people go wow. Um, so that's, that, that's the main challenge from us from a design side. Can you tell me about any of the things that you have designed that are utterly amazing and also kind of unique and ridiculous and strange all at the same time? What have you been asked to make? So um, one thing that um, we designed recently was a, um, a beautiful set of um, uh, seats that fold out of the back of the Cullinan. So you can change the... Um, the rear space of the Cullinan into an area where you can sit out and have a picnic or enjoy some time with friends around the back of the car. So something that's, you know, um, normally not, you don't, you can't really do with, with a normal uh, car, but we've designed this sort of space around the back of the Cullinan that allows that. Um, another thing that we've been doing is um, designing a, a, a sort of a sleeker looking um, speedster feature on, on our convertible. So uh, changing the, the Dawn from being a, a four-seat convertible into this sort of two-seat roadster, so making it look really super sleek, super elegant, um, and have a really sort of a dynamic look to the car. Rolls-Royce, at being one of the, 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 the car companies that are at the top of the tree of all car companies, you've always got to be forward-thinking. Um, and I would imagine making cars is pretty complete now. We've made them that go really, really fast. They're so efficient. What's left to come with car designing in the future? Uh, how can we improve it? What's going to change? Uh, how can we make everything better? So um, that, that's one of the main, main challenges for us at the moment. So we're doing a lot of research in how we can um, Change our change our approach to 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 car design. One one thing is around, you know, uh, thinking about materials. So um, different materials that are perhaps slightly more responsible 
um, with the, the change in requirements from our from our customers. So we're we're um, that's one of our one of our challenges at the moment. And Mike, you've got a competition for people who want to design cars right now while we're stuck at home, don't you? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, we have indeed. Yeah, we um, we came up with the the idea at Rolls Royce of um, bringing a competition out that allows young designers who are at home during this lockdown period to to have a like quite a rare opportunity to um, let their imaginations and, and creativity run wild and and design an amazing Rolls Royce of of their dreams. So um, this is uh, a competition for um, young designers of you know 16 or, or below um so the competition's been open for around about oh just just under a week now um but we've all already seen um you know over a couple of hundred designs submitted uh, to our micro site and there's some some amazing ideas already already flooding in and we're really looking forward to seeing um what other designs come uh from from uh other uh, uh, aspiring designers who who have some ideas of of uh, how to design a Rolls Royce of the future. Amazing! And and how do we enter it? Where do we need to go? So there's a, a micro site that we've created that's um, that's uh, wwwrolls royce young designer competition dot com, and on that site you can submit your design and also see a little bit more information about it. And um, the winner um, is is going to be chosen by us within the Rolls Royce design team. So we're going to review each and every um, design that gets submitted. And the uh, there's some great prizes for for the for the winner of the competition. Um, I think one of the favorite my favorite prizes that that, uh, that you can get is the is a chauffeur driven uh, Rolls Royce Phantom when you return back to school after the lockdown. So you and your best friend can can get a, a lift from from your home to your school um, in one of the coolest cars around the, the Rolls Royce Phantom. And also we'll um, take the design um, or the sketches and drawings that have been sent by the winner. And we, we within the design team will create a professional rendering of, of their design um, for them and, and, and share that with them. And also their um, their school will get a, a green power electric kit car um, that, that the the winner and, and their classmates can work together to build. So really really fun thing to do uh, when when we when we all get returned back to back when to school. we all get back. Uh, brilliant. Yeah. That's a love. That's a lovely touch at the end. Mike Bryden, thank you so much for joining us. Ah, uh, thank you very much. For this week's Dangerous Dan, we're headed into the jungles of Brazil to meet the Lanomia. The Lanomia is a bug, but it's a bug known by a much cooler name. You see, the Lanomia is also called the Assassin Caterpillar. It's coated in a poison that makes you bleed and stops your clotting. And it gives you something as well called bruised blood, where parts of your body will swell up like you've been hit. You know, when you get that reddy pinky mark where, when you've been hit or something, well, that's a, that's a bruise. That's because there's blood underneath the surface. When, you're, when you get bitten by a Lanomia, an assassin caterpillar, it bleeds underneath. That's what's going on all the time, and you can't, it can't, you can't stop it happening. Uh, you feel a bit of pain in there, but there's something really serious happening. Because the blood can't stop coming out, it causes your organs to stop working. Your heart, your lungs, and even your brain will slowly stop. Now, for things to get that bad, the caterpillar needs to sting you almost a hundred times. The problem is, this caterpillar is a master of disguise. It's a greeny-brown colour with a furry texture all over it that means it blends into plants all around the jungle. People might put their hand onto a tree and then get stung, get stung loads without even realising it. And get this, right? Uh, Reports of poisonings have gone up much more recently, which has left scientists baffled. They think the Lanomia... The assassin caterpillar maybe has only recently realised just how dangerous it is. Let's get some of your gadget questions answered now on the show uh, with an episode from our Techno Mum series. Techno Mum's Connected World. I was getting ready for school and telling mum about the new amazing interactive studio that we have. It can project movies onto all the walls and the floor. 
and the ceiling too to make it seem like you're really in ancient Rome or the moon or even a thousand meters under the sea. It's so cool. I can't wait for my form to get our turn. And to think that I had to make do with a chalkboard. Like lots of modern buildings, your school is really using technology in a lot of new and exciting ways. Yeah, like the lights. They only go on if someone's in the room. That helps save energy. It's the same with the heating too. That's certainly smart. And technology is going to get even smarter. Think about how your school already connects technology together at lunchtime. You mean how I pay for my school dinners with my fingerprint? You see, that's an example of a connected building. I upload your dinner money to a payment website and the sensors in the school cafe upload the amount you've spent each day to work out the new balance. Does that mean you can go online and see exactly how much I spent? Sure can. And can you tell um, what I spent it on? You mean I can tell if you chose 10 sticky buns instead of a sandwich? The technology could do that for sure, but don't worry, your school doesn't include that information. Not yet. I don't like the sound of that. I demand lunch privacy! Well, that's why it's important to be careful what digital information we share and with whom. Often there's the opportunity to decide for ourselves. If you're online, you may get something called privacy policy to check out. But they're always really, really long and boring. Well, get me or Dad to have a look. We filled out paper forms about your lunch options to agree to using the fingerprint technology in a way that was right for our family. I suppose the school could take the information about what we had ordered and use the internet to instantly place new orders of the popular food so they'd never run out of sticky buns. Absolutely. And think about the lifts. Sometimes they break down and that can mean kids running late to class. And that's really a problem for the kids and teachers who use wheelchairs. What if the lift could diagnose itself? upload the data to the internet and find out how to fix its computer programs. And all in a matter of seconds, perhaps. Almost like the building's alive. You'd never have to take the register. You could use smartphones to track where all us kids are and ring them up or message them if they were in the wrong place. That would have been handy when you started at that school. Sure would. I was wandering around science block for an hour when I should have been in PE. Well, we all have to learn. And buildings, smart connected buildings, can learn too. Like, is it too hot or cold in a classroom? If any of the equipment is on the blink. And which corridors are the busiest? All this information shared between devices, computers, the internet, to help make buildings smarter and more comfortable places to be. School? Comfortable? Well, not as comfortable as lounging around in your pyjamas. Come on, you. Time to get dressed. Techno Mums Connected World. With support from the Institution of Engineering and Technology. Find out more at fungudslive.com slash technomum. It's time for this week's Science in the News. We got quite a lot of climate change in this one. 2019 was Europe's warmest year on record. Over the past five years, global temperatures were on average one degree warmer than they were a century ago. But they do show uh, the findings that the past five years have been the hottest on record as the world heats up with climate change. Also, the United Nations are urging the world not to forget the environmental urgency that the planet is facing amid the coronavirus pandemic. They've said that we still need to do our bit for the future of the planet. We need to reduce emissions and we need to cut down our carbon footprint when we can and finally a drought equal to the worst on record has hit the western united states the mega drought is a naturally occurring event according to scientists it started 20 years ago in the year 2000 but climate change is making the drought much worse and there's a lack of water a huge lack of water covering a large chunk of america And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for having a listen. If you've got a sciencey question that you want answered on the show, if you've been inspired by anything that we've heard today, uh, let me do the work for you. I will become your your sciencey Sherlock, searching around for the answers to your questions. I need to know what they are first, so do leave it as a review for the Fun Kids Science Weekly on Apple Podcasts. There's a place where you give us five stars. You can leave your name so I can say hello. There's a little comment box at the bottom. That's where you leave your question. Also, when you're on Apple Podcasts, it's one of the best ways that you can hear all the science series that we do. There's loads on there. You can find them wherever you get your shows from, and they're also on our Fun Kids app. And Fun Kids are a children's radio station from the UK. You can hear us all around the country on that free Fun Kids app, uh, on your DAB digital radio, and as always at funkidslive.com 